Okay. And then you're on. Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to my talk. I'm Steve Crystal. Uh, just fair warning up front that if you're hoping to hear the words epoxy or fiberglass, this is the wrong session for you to be in. This is a talk about building paper rockets. Why was I asked to give this talk? Well, I've been building paper rockets since Naram 49, a long time ago. Uh, the uh, uh, I routinely fly them in NAR and international competition. I've won numerous contests with them. My daughter and I have both set a large number of altitude records. But I didn't invent paper rockets. Um, as I know, the first people to take them to a NARAM event were Buzz Naw and Al De La Glacia. They were new time uh, competitors and showed up at uh, NARAM 33 in 1991. And for whatever reason, they had built rockets out of vellum, and they did very well. They won some events, and uh, that really brought them to the notice of others. I personally learned about them from Dr. Andy Tomash, uh, who was on the Internats team, and many years ago had a wonderful article online about his model that he called the paper tiger. Uh, that is no longer available. Uh, so hopefully Andy will get that back online. Why build paper rockets? Well, there's a lot of reasons to do it. I do it primarily because I use them for competition. They're incredibly low weight, low drag, and they're almost free to build. Uh, the wonderful thing about that is that you can uh, do iteration after iteration after iteration, and it costs virtually nothing. Also, as you can see from these, they've got some pretty good graphics, and I am not that good at painting, so uh, I really like using the computer to do my graphics. The final thing that I'm not gonna talk about very much during this presentation is that there are a million wonderful paper scale models online. Uh, truly a huge number of them. Very, very easy to convert. Uh, this bad boy to the right here, my very first NAR event was, I was invited to a Bertha bash. And so I printed out a paper model of a Vostok, and I added it to a Bertha. This is the Bertha Vostok. You'll notice it's signed by Vern down here. He's half the designer of this rocket. Also, as a special note, I won the contest that night, and the contest was was uh, judged by Peter Allway. So this is a very special paper rocket I built. Let's talk about the general workflow of building paper rockets, especially uh, competition rockets. Uh, the first thing you're going to do is design this in a computer program. I use Roxim, many use Open Rocket. It doesn't make any difference. The next thing you're going to do is figure out what your body tube size is going to be. And then you're going to go into your graphics program and use that to create graphic outlines of the body tube pieces. You're going to print them, you're going to cut them out, you're going to assemble them on a mandrel. Then what I do is I take them and I weigh them and I feed that back into my uh, Roxim program. That gives me a really good idea of how stable these are going to be. And designing these for competition, I'm trying to design to the bleeding edge of stability. Uh, once final, I add fins, nose cone, recovery system, and I go fly. So let's get started. This is an example of uh, one of the designs I've done for a 13 millimeter altitude rocket in Roxim. You'll notice that uh, I take the fins all the way to the back edge. Uh, again, I'm designing these to the very bleeding edge of stability. You want minimum diameter and you want them to be optimal mass. Now, I know most of you watching this understand what optimal mass is. I know there will be some who do not. Optimal mass is the right weight for your rocket. It's a combination of a rocket that will boost highest and then coast the furthest. It's kind of like thinking about the difference between throwing a baseball and a wiffle ball. Wiffle balls are much lighter, but you can't throw them as far. The same is true with rockets. And I know that both Roxim and Open Rocket have functions that allow you to figure out what is the optimal mass for this rocket. The next thing you're going to do when designing these is picking a paper. This is my very favorite uh, for competition rockets. It's called vellum. 
Vellum is paper, but it also has other fibers in it. I believe linen. Very, very lightweight, surprisingly strong for what it is. Uh, but which paper you use for various projects is dependent upon uh, what that project is. There are different weights of paper, strengths of paper, finishes of paper, and sizes of paper. This is just a list from one company of all of the papers they make. Now, you'll notice these numbers over here. These are what they call the weights of the paper. You've seen, you know, you know, 100 pound bond paper and that kind of stuff. Well, the thing that you need to know is that weights are just approximate. They're not really accurate. Uh, you can get a 22 pound paper that actually weighs more than a 27 pound paper. So you just have to experiment. I personally own more paper than anybody you know. Uh, for building most rockets, I tend to use cardstock, 60 pound. Uh, presentation paper uh, is actually 30 pound. It's a little more expensive, uh, but if you want lighter weight, uh, that's what you need to use. For really beautiful finishes, like some of the rockets I'll show you later, I use uh, photographic paper. And those can vary between 25 pounds all the way up to 100 pounds. I already mentioned vellum uh, for competition rockets. I use uh, the lowest weight vellum I can find, which is 17 pound. Now, that's the upside. The downside of using vellum is that it is extremely water sensitive. Uh, if you're flying a rocket early in the morning out of vellum and it lands on the grass, even though it hasn't been raining, your rocket's probably going to be ruined because the dew will cause it to crinkle. So it's worthwhile uh, thinking about that. There are waterproof papers. Uh, there's numbers of companies that uh, uh, um, sell those. Uh, I've used them for some things, not others. Uh, and uh, there's actually Nomex paper, fireproof paper. My daughter Emma and I used that in our very first competition. We thought, wow, what a wonderful idea. Turns out it wasn't, because although it doesn't burn, it does crinkle. Sizes of paper. Uh, there are very large vellum, like the kind I use. These boxes here, these are actually rolls of vellum, 17 pound and 22 pound. You can take these to a professional printer and they will print these for you. Obviously, I only have an inkjet printer, so I can't put this uh, 14 by 17 paper in my uh, uh, printer at home. But there's all different kinds of papers you can use. All right. The downside to doing paper rockets, uh, besides if they get wet, uh, is that they don't handle Estes ejection charges very well. This rocket here and this rocket here are both fiberglass. Uh, even they, you can see, uh, have trouble handling Estes ejection charges. This rocket is one that I made out of uh, waterproof paper. I flew these in Alamosa. I had no idea. These are actually about 26 pound paper, but you can see that they bubbled. And this was the best of them. They bubbled so badly on some of them that they just folded in half. There were none of these that I could fly a second time. So like I said, ejection charges are a problem. What do you do about it? Well, the simplest thing to do is to cut a short piece of coupler tube and slide that into the rocket just above your motor. Uh, these are one inch pieces. I found for 13 millimeter rockets, those work very well. Um, but obviously they add a bit of weight. And when you're really trying to shave off every fraction of a gram, uh, you may not want to use them. The other thing that I do is I use uh, aluminum foil tape. This tape happens to be 1.2 mil in thickness. You can see here's the outline shape that I'm going to roll on the mandrel. I just put a piece of tape on it, and this stuff is so thin that you can burnish it completely smooth. I use the uh, uh, edge of a Sharpie to do that. Very quick, very easy. Uh, the only downside to doing this is that if you're using uh, very small diameter tubes, 13 millimeter or less, even that 1.2 mil, when you wrap it around the mandrel, will cause a slight bump uh, in the side of the tube. Not a huge deal, but something to consider. All right, the next step after you've picked what size you're going to make it and you've measured out how wide you want your uh, uh, tubes to be, 
you're going to create the body tube graphics on any program. Uh, some things to consider. Always do multiples of them. It costs you nothing, and these things are virtually free to make. Uh, the more you have, the better uh, you will do. Uh, you always want to put a registration line, the thinnest that your graphics program will do, across the middle of your outline. Why? Because that allows you to truly precisely uh, line up your uh, body tube piece on the mandrel as you roll it. Some other things to consider, obviously, the graphics. You can put your name and AR number on them. I always put a little thing on here about calling me if you find it. And these little dots here, another thing. These are uh, precisely placed uh, uh, points where I'm going to put a little pin through to create altimeter vent holes. So lots and lots of things you can do uh, with the graphics. Another little blurb about graphics. I mentioned registration lines. These are on my wider tubes. You can see these registration lines. Really important, really helpful. The other thing is, uh, how much of an overlap do you leave? Uh, on almost all of mine, I leave between an eighth and a quarter inch. It's really not that important. And for the body tube pieces, you don't even need to mark it out. You're just going to pull it around the mandrel, and wherever it lines up, it lines up. A word about making transitions for paper rockets. There are some wonderful programs online to create transitions. This is my very favorite uh, called Delori.com. You can look it up. Here's what it looks like for standard rockets if you want to make a paper transition. You can just put in the size of the uh, smaller tube, the size of the larger tube, and then how long you want it. And you hit generate PDF and it uh, will create a, a PDF. Now, the thing about those PDFs is that they're very functional. They are really not very attractive. So I then take that PDF and I put it in my graphics program and I use that to uh, decorate the uh, transition. All right, printing the graphics, pretty straightforward. I do all of mine on a uh, inkjet. Uh, you can use laser jet. I've had a number of them that were longer professionally printed. And again, I uh, always do multiples. Cutting out the material, pretty straightforward, except I have a little trick to show you. This is what I've done to my metal ruler. Uh, they have cork on them to keep them from sliding. But if you have the cork all the way on it, uh, it sits up just a little bit off the paper. And believe it or not, it can cause your knife to vary just enough that the lines aren't perfectly straight. So what I did was I just removed the cork from half of a cheap ruler. And this way, this cork uh, keeps it from sliding around, but this edge sits directly on the paper, allows for much straighter lines. The lines, believe it or not, going down the length of the tube are really pretty unimportant. Even if those are wavy, it won't make any difference. I worry about straightness for the edges at the top and the bottom of the tube so that it uh, aligns very nicely with a nose cone. All right, I've mentioned this before, always make multiples. And then you're going to roll these on a mandrel. Now, uh, you can see here, I have a PVC a holder for the mandrel that I've made. Uh, this one works on all of the various uh, uh, mandrels that I have. Let's talk about mandrels. You saw those. My favorite are these steel mandrels. Very inexpensive. You, these are what is called drill rod stock. And you can buy those from McMaster Car, other places. This one is 10.2 millimeters, 13 millimeters, 18 millimeters. Now, before I actually got those, I simply used expended uh, motor casings to make a mandrel. I just put a uh, dowel down the middle, some epoxy, and then just sanded off uh, the little edges. And it worked very well. I used that for uh, uh, quite some time. And without the rod in the middle, you may cause it to break. Uh, now, this mandrel, something different. Uh, I actually had uh, Gordy Agnello, who many of you know as Sandman, uh, make this for me. This is for, uh, I use it for one item and one item only, and that's the transitions that I am uh, making uh, for the rockets that uh, Galactic Manufacturer uh, will be retailing for people trying out for FAI. These two mandrels are what many of you may have seen uh, that FAI flyers use for fiberglass. I use them for paper. 
the one with the longer transition section uh, is a pretty standard model. The shorter one is one used for helicopter models. And of note, both of these have 10 millimeter uh, motor mount sections. Uh, mandrel holders, uh, you can use wood or PVC, it's really not important. Now, one final thing is that uh, one of my colleagues actually uses PVC uh, and uh, it is wrapped with masking tape. And he just keeps adding uh, uh, ribbons of masking tape to it until it's the right diameter. And this is somebody who is a very accomplished, very high tech flyer. All right, how are you going to attach these when you roll them around the mandrel? Uh, there's a bunch of different ways. You can use scotch tape, mylar tape, double-sided tape, scrapbooking tape, and there's people who like to use glue. I am not amongst those. I use glue for transitions and for joining tubes to boat tails, but for the models themselves, I just use masking tape. I want to point out that many people are surprised when I tell them I do that. You know, well, how, how long do those last? That's just garbage. This model here was one that my daughter flew in Serbia in 2010. At that time, both the body tube and her sustainer on these two stage models were made out of vellum. Uh, this one is now 12 years old. It's still in perfect shape. A lot of the cardstock ones that I fly over and over again in events, uh, five, six, seven years old. Believe it or not, magic transparent tape is really magic. Now, when do I use glues? I use glues for uh, transitions. White glue, if you put it on very thin, just rub your finger over it to a point where you can just see it glistening. That will set up just as quickly as super glue. Uh, the, uh, there are some other things in this picture I want to show you just because I found them helpful. Uh, these are little glue tips. You can see how fine they are. You can stick them on cheapo glue. You can stick them on expensive glue, but they allow you to put a very, very precise amount of uh, cyanoacrylate on something. These are my very favorite uh, super glues. You can buy them at Dollar Tree. It's a dollar, maybe it's a dollar 25 now since they changed, but it's a, a basically a buck for two tubes. And for those of you who have not used super glue gel, it is absolutely wonderful stuff. It's very thick and it's usually very expensive. The price at Dollar Tree is just stupidly cheap. Uh, this stuff at Walmart is like four or five times as expensive. Final item I wanted to show you was these little items that the only rocketry company I know of that sells them is E-Rockets. They're called the Glue Looper, L-O-O-P-E-R. Uh, I first learned about them from Randy's site. He had a little, little blurb about them. I figured I'd give it a shot. What they are is there's these stamped metal pieces that just fit into a uh, X-Acto blade holder, and they allow you to put a really tiny drop of either super glue or accelerator, and that's how I use them. The nice part about these is you can put super glue down, liquid super glue, and when you touch it with a teeny tiny drop of accelerator like this, the uh, super glue doesn't craze. It doesn't turn all crinkly. It stays nice and smooth. So the glue looper has become uh, absolutely essential to my building. It's one of those items that you get and you wonder how you ever lived without it. So anyway, you can get those at E-Rockets. All right, here's my very favorite. Scotch Magic Transparent Tape. Why? Uh, because when you put this on something, you can see where it's really stuck down. Uh, the color is different. So you have to burnish it down to the tube. But when you do, the transparent stuff really shows you uh, that you've got it completely down. Uh, you have a choice of, of uh, half inch or three quarter inch. I use the different sizes for different projects. 13 millimeter tubes, I always do uh, with the half inch. Uh, bigger tubes, I'll do with the bigger stuff. Not because it's stronger, but just because it's a little bit easier to handle. All right, let's get into the actual steps of making one of these tubes. Uh, here's my uh, printout that I've cut out to the right size. I take a piece of the Scotch Magic transparent tape and I, rip, I cut it a little bit longer than my tube piece. The next thing I do is I want the sticky side up, so I flip it over and tape it down to the, uh, my working surface. 
I do that at both ends, and that makes this nice and straight. That allows me to very easily take my body tube graphic and put it face down onto the tape about halfway uh, down the length of the tape. That allows you to do this very precisely. Then always uh, rub this down to the tape before you go to put it on the mandrel. That makes sure you just don't have any bubbles. And one of the reasons I said to do multiples is occasionally that happens. And these are so cheap, you just throw it away. Now, after you put the tape on, you're gonna trim the ends very precisely on both sides. And then you're actually going to roll it onto the mandrel. For things, this is a piece of vellum paper. You can see cardstock over here. For vellum on these 18 millimeter models that I'm demonstrating, you do not need to pre-curl this stuff. It is uh, absolutely flexible enough. You can do it without a problem. I always like to put it behind with the tape on top. It's just what I've uh, become used to over the years. So what do you do? You start to roll the tube and you can't see it. I covered it up in the photo, but the registration marks that I have on the middle, I pull that absolutely precisely up to the one on the other side. I use my thumbs to, to hold the tube up there, and then you can see the top part of the registration mark there, and I uh, affix the tape. I always try to do that in the middle, and uh, as uh, James Duffy said in his fiberglassing uh, uh, demonstration, I uh, work from the middle out to the sides. This tape is stiff enough that it really doesn't bubble, and it really doesn't uh, snag on itself. All right. After I've got the tape just rubbed down with my finger, you need to burnish it down to really rub it down. I use this incredibly expensive tool called a popsicle stick, and that works wonderful. The other thing that I use is a uh, the edge of a Sharpie. The side of a Sharpie works really, really well. And once you're done, you're gonna slide it off the mandrel, and there you have a vellum tube. Uh, with wonderful graphics, ultra lightweight, uh, very easy, very cheap, very quick. I'm going to show you now just how quick it is to make one of these. Here's a little video. Uh, I don't know how the sound will come through to you, uh, but we will see. All right, now I'm going to show you the same uh, kind of video uh, doing a much bigger tube. This one is done out of presentation paper, 30-pound uh, cardstock. These are the ones that we are doing for uh, FAI-style flying. All right, 
Moving along, let's talk about transitions. Uh, those FAI style rockets are going to have a boat tail on them. So I used the Delory program to create the shape. I dragged it into my graphics program and then spent way more time than anybody in their right mind would spend creating the graphics on these. Uh, I will forewarn you, you will see this graphic on every FAI style rocket that I launched for the rest of my life because it took so long to do this. Anyway, the other thing I want to show you is that uh, on these, they actually have a tab on the side that I'm going to use to overlap. The important thing about the transitions is that the tape is going to go on this side and this tab is going to wrap around underneath. The other thing is along the top, in order to attach these to uh, the body tube, you're going to need some uh, serrations along the top. You can either notch these very nicely, or all I do is just put lines here and then a little slit in them. They'll overlap the tiniest bit inside the tube, but that doesn't matter. So you're going to cut these out very precisely. And again, you're going to cut all those notches in them. Uh, the only downside to doing these kind of transitions is cutting all these notches every time. All right. Now, for this uh, uh, kind of piece, to do a transition out of a cardstock, you do need to pre-curl these. I just roll them up on my finger. It does not have to be the right shape. Just curled up any curl in it at all uh, works fine. You're then going to take that and uncurl it a little bit and put it on your scotch tape. And again, you're going to trim the ends off and then you're ready to go. Now, something a little bit different for doing these transitions. Um, these transitions are not at, that I make are not actually the same size as the transitions on the mandrel. You do not need a mandrel with uh, any kind of a transition shape in order to do these. I usually do these actually on a 13 millimeter uh, straight piece of drill stock. But a trick is to cut a little piece of scotch tape and just inside where the tab is, uh, far enough away that your tape won't, your scotch tape won't overlap it, you tape it to the mandrel. That keeps this thing from sliding around. Then it's a very simple uh, procedure to take the taped edge and just move it up to where the uh, tab line is. Because you have something hard underneath, it's really not a problem lining it up. And then same thing again. I use the popsicle stick burnisher uh, to burnish the tape down and then remove the uh, scotch, the uh, masking tape and you're good to go. All right, now that you have the transition section and you've got your body tube made, how do you attach these two things together? Well, there's a trick to that as well. You take your body tube piece and you put it upright. You put the transition in the direction that it's going to be. It's gonna be off this end. You just put it inside the tube, no glue or anything on it. Now that's in the tube with the pointy end going this way. You then take your mandrel that you rolled this on, so it's the perfect size, and you start putting the mandrel inside the tube and using that to push the transition up. Because you've precisely cut the end of your transition piece, and when you lined it up and taped it, that is completely uh, symmetrical, and it sits on top of the mandrel, and it will come up here absolutely precisely. You're not going to have to move this around and move this around and figure out if it's uh, uh, lined up correctly. So once you've done that, you're going to use the mandrel to push it all the way up to the right spot. And it's very easy on these transitions because what's the right spot? Well, it's right where those uh, little cut notches start. So anyway, it goes all the way up there. One thing I will forewarn you, is you need to back your mandrel out. Do not start super gluing with the mandrel in place. Not that I would have ever done that, but it can be somewhat problematic to get a glued mandrel out of one of these tubes. Anyway, I then use my uh, uh, little uh, bottles of super glue with the extender on them and run the super glue all the way around this. Believe it or not, it will wick in and these are very strong. These will not break apart. I know if you've never done one, it's hard to believe, but it's really true. I have these rockets that I've flown multiple, multiple times. They do not have any strengthener inside. There is no centering ring in there. It is just the super glue that is wicked in paper to paper. Uh, 
let me show you uh, how simple this is to do. And that's really all you need to do. You don't have to do multiple coats or anything. Uh, it wicks in and it stays just fine. All right, the last part of building something like this is that it needs a motor mount. Uh, obviously for the ones we fly here in the US, we're gonna use a 13 millimeter motor mount. Now you need to put something on the outside. You can use BT5 plus, uh, which is easier, but I just cut a uh, quarter inch long pieces of uh, BT5 and put a slice in them. I'm gonna put that on the outside of this to serve as a block to keep this from sliding through the end of that transition. I tend to use tight bond too is my favorite. What do I do? I put a little drop of glue on there. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you rub around it with your finger to make it very, very thin uh, to the point where that piece will just grab onto it. I then put these around and literally it takes less than five seconds for this thing to be set up to the point where you can go ahead and insert it. All right, how do I make sure that my motor mount is correctly lined up in here? It really doesn't matter if the transition is off by a little bit. What's important is that the motor mount be absolutely in line with the center line of your body tube. So this is a fixture that I use. The one that you see here is actually from uh, Apogee Components, Tim Van Milligan. He makes a, a kit uh, to make uh, FAI style rockets, 13 millimeter tube, 40 millimeter uh, centering rings. And then at the end, it's just got a piece of coupler tubing. So what do I do? I take this, you put it on the end, you put glue around this part, and you put the whole thing, slide it all the way down. When this piece gets to here, it stops on its own. So with this, you know that it's absolutely precisely lined up. So way too many pictures showing me putting the motor mount onto the uh, fixture. Uh, way too many pictures of glue. And again, this glue is not thin. I tend to put a, a fairly good amount of glue here because I want it to catch in the end of that transition piece. And here I am putting the fixture in. You can see it getting pushed down. And here it is almost all the way in. And you can see this uh, uh, motor mount piece just slides in and it'll, sl it'll stop on its own when it gets to the point where the glue uh, and the uh, external block are uh, touching. I then just pull the fixture out and set this aside to dry. All right, all you need to do at that point, you've got your body tube, your transition, you've got a motor mount. Uh, these are very, very lightweight. When you build these out of vellum uh, and uh, uh, cardstock here, I've actually built these out of vellum as well. You can get these models down as light as eight or nine grams. Really, really lightweight. All right, I want to step it up a notch here and show you that uh, paper building techniques are not just for building uh, cylindrical tubes or even cylindrical tubes with the transition. This is a very high tech rocket. This is one of the uh, altitude rockets that my daughter and I uh, flew to get on the team uh, for this uh, last team that competed in Romania. These have 13 millimeter motor mounts. The upper stage, the second stage, is actually unibody fiberglass. But all of this, this is all waterproof paper. Notice that it has a forward transition, body tube, and a boat tail. The fins here are uh, ultra-thin carbon fiber fins that glue directly to the boat tail. There is uh, a centering ring inside here to keep them uh, from wobbling, but uh, it's basically all just paper. These are very sophisticated rockets. What you don't see is that down the middle, this is a gap stage tube in the middle of this. And this gap stage tube uh, is actually made out of vellum. Really? You're going to have a booster motor that shoots a ball of flame all the way up to this and catches this motor on fire and it doesn't burn up a vellum tube? I'll show you how that is possible. Uh, the other issue is how do you build one of these with both a forward transition and a boat tail on them, you, once you've covered up one end, how do you get the other piece in? We'll talk about that. One more piece of sophistication to this. Uh, obviously, I mentioned they have the uh, transition and the tail cone. The other piece of sophistication is that that gap stage tube that goes down the middle, that is not glued in place. That is actually free to fall out the back of the rocket. Uh, 
uh, it stays in the rocket when you're launching it because the sustainer motor is in the top end. But why do we do this? Well, because for FAI, that booster has to have a streamer on it. How do you put a streamer on this with the least drag possible? Well, you put it inside. This technique was uh, taught to me by Dr. Bob Kreutz, who actually set a world record in this event. Now, he did not make his models out of paper. He made his out of fiberglass paper. Very similar techniques. So what happens is when the, the uh, sustainer motor ignites and uh, starts to, to leave, this piece is blown out the back and it has a streamer on it. Really simple. How do you install both the transition and the tail cone? Well, there's a little trick. Do you see this here? That looks like a registration line, but it's not. That's actually, these two tubes separate there and there's a piece of uh, uh, scotch tape that goes around the outside of these. Uh, believe it or not, it holds it just fine. Uh, you can uh, peel up the scotch tape if need be. Uh, if you fly your first flight and that uh, gap stage tube gets damaged, you can open this up and put another one in. Now, talking about uh, the gap stage tube, you'll see this here. Believe it or not, the end where the booster is doesn't even get toasty. It's hard to believe that an Estes booster motor can fire off inside a vellum tube, send a ball of flame all the way up to the sustainer motor long enough to ignite it, and it not burn this tube. You'll notice here that I actually have this upper portion protected by aluminum foil. Why? Because the sustainer motor will just immolate this tube. And it does it not just for paper tubes, but it does it for uh, fiberglass tubes as well. A testament to how good Estes products are, uh, an Estes BT5 tube in the middle will not uh, catch on fire. Uh, but they're much thicker, they're much heavier. So uh, I wanted something different. The idea to use vellum was suggested to me by one of my junior teammates. I explained to him that that was ridiculous, that wouldn't possibly work. And the more I thought about it, I figured out a way to make it work. So I am, uh, Emma and I are very uh, grateful to Trevor Harrison for that suggestion. Uh, you can see the aluminum foil on the inside of this gap stage tube. And here are the vent holes you need for gap staging. So how do you put the two pieces together? Again, very, very simple. In the center is just two uh, centering rings that were uh, foam safe super glued to each other. Uh, the most aft one gets glued right into the aft tube piece. That leaves a little piece sticking above that's just perfect for uh, sliding the upper piece on uh, and giving you something strong enough that you can tape all the way around. So like I said, paper rocket, really, really sophisticated. Uh, my daughter and I flew these uh, to first and third place in the US flyoffs. We flew very similar uh, models in Europe and didn't do very well at all with them. Uh, but I just wanted to show you something really uh, different in terms of how you build paper rockets. All right, let's talk a little bit about parts and pieces. Uh, nose cones, it's actually one of the most important things for paper rockets. Uh, uh, they make standard uh, uh, vacuform nose cones. I think Apogee is the only place that's selling these anymore. This is a, uh, a 10 millimeter, 13 millimeter, 18 millimeter. They actually make 24 millimeter, and I've actually made 24 millimeter uh, vellum rockets. They flew just fine. Uh, also, there's balsa uh, nose cones uh, that you can get from a number of places. Uh, those work very well. The final thing is paper nose cones. Now, as good as I am at making paper rockets, I stink at paper making at making paper nose cones. This is from my friend Chris Flanagan who is an aeronautical engineer. Uh, and Chris also builds paper rockets and he builds these paper nose cones that are just unbelievable. He cuts these out on his laser cutter. You can see the precision which, with which even the notches are cut. These are four pieces. Chris has been kind enough to send these to me. And I will tell you that I needed a psych appointment after I tried to put one together. I, I just really couldn't do this. But Chris does it and he's been very successful with them. The hardest part about paper nose cones, and you could just make simple cones for paper rockets, is always this last little bit at the top. 
it getting that really smooth and nice. And uh, that's why I don't use them. I tend to use uh, uh, the vacuform cones instead. Let's talk about fins. Wide variety of fins. Obviously, there's balsa, balsa fins, uh, one thirty second, both glassed and unglassed. These are fins from uh, aerospace specialty products, the small clip delta uh, fiberglass fins, uh, 0 0.16 uh, inches in the thickness. And finally, these are uh, carbon fiber fins. Uh, I purchased a, a 0 0.03 uh, carbon fiber that seems to be stiff enough. The difficulty with these is that you can indeed cut them uh, using a uh, X-Acto, but then they're never exactly the same size and you have to sand the groups together. Uh, you can't have these cut on a uh, laser cutter because it just melts carbon fiber. It won't cut a smooth edge. So I actually found somebody, uh, Rick Randall of New Way Rockets. He makes the square rockets. Uh, his son, Luke, uh, has a CNC machine and Luke cut these for me really, really nicely done. Again, somewhat difficult to do on a CNC machine. You have to cover the entire piece of carbon fiber with tape because otherwise, as it gets to the last little bit with the uh, router spinning, it flings these across the room. So uh, Luke figured out a way to do it and he makes absolutely beautiful fins. The last thing I want to mention in terms of fins for these kinds of rockets uh, are glassed foam. Uh, my colleagues, uh, Kevin Kuchik, uh, and uh, uh, Terrell Willard uh, do glass foam, either Depron or Roacel, and uh, Jay Marsh does these also. I, I, I have never made them myself. Uh, I'm sure I could, but I just haven't. Those will weigh way less than any of these. As a matter of fact, I think for our rockets that we just launched in Romania, uh, Kevin's fins weighed less than uh, uh, less than half, about a third of what similar carbon fiber fins weigh. Just amazing. Shot cords, pretty typical. Uh, 28 pounds, 70 pound, 100 pound. Uh, the most I ever use is 70 pound, uh, 28 pound, uh, less frequently. Uh, where do you put your shot cords? There's two choices. Uh, but you can do them for my FAI style rockets. We all tend to use this external uh, shot cord that just gets laid into the fin groove and then some uh, CA is put on here. When I mentioned earlier about using the glue looper and a very tiny amount of uh, uh, accelerator, look how smooth that is. Uh, it's just amazing. If you put, if you sprayed this with the accelerator bottle, this would be all rough and crazed. Now, the other thing that you can do is what's called a lariat loop. I know a number of you uh, know what that is, but there's a number who don't. A lariat loop is what I use on all of my uh, paper rockets uh, that I launch for altitude. It's simply a length of, uh, of a Kevlar that goes down and has a loop on the end, uh, usually just a slip knot. You slip that around the motor and uh, do it tight. This line's going up. So what that's actually the attachment for your uh, shot cord. I always put a small dot of super glue on these so that they don't come apart. Last item is once you've done that, how do you retain these motors in these paper rockets? Well, this is something oddly enough called a crystal window. I wonder who that was named after. Uh, it's just a quarter inch paper punch. You punch two holes and then uh, straighten it up and you use this mylar tape with aggressive adhesive. It's the standard stuff you see people using the silver tape and you put a short piece on here. Uh, you don't need to do this on all three sides. Two sides is enough. I have never had one of these let go. And this is what it looks like uh, in the uh, uh, FAI style rockets. You'll notice that the, another reason that I do that is so that I can end the fins right at the end of the rocket. And that leaves me part of the motor sticking out that I can then put tape on to put into a piston. So, uh, but again, this kind of thing right at the end is uh, for uh, bleeding edge stability and the motors stay in just fine, just using a simple piece of Mylar tape. All right, that pretty much takes us uh, through the entire thing. Uh, I am going to uh, turn this off and then uh, answer questions in the Q&A in just a second. But I wanted to point out uh, these particular rockets. Uh, high performance, low cost, great graphics, really easy to build, and cheap, cheap, cheap. 
This is one of our standard FAI style rockets, the kind you saw me make. This is one of the uh, altitude rockets. This is a, a FAI style that I made uh, special uh, for the Firefly competition. Uh, if you look at any of the uh, photos of the head of Firefly, when he is interviewed on his uh, cabinet behind him is one of these rockets. And I made these out of uh, uh, photo paper uh, just so the finish would look really nice. This is one that I had professionally printed. This is a scale altitude model made on a 30 millimeter mandrel. Uh, and again, same thing, ultra lightweight. This model uh, is what I flew uh, at the most recent NARAM uh, for uh, payload. And it has a vellum payload compartment, a uh, little transition section that you can buy uh, from Apogee. And again, a vellum uh, body tube. Believe it or not, this is strong enough to withstand having a standard payload above it. Uh, this model is a uh, 13 millimeter super rock. Again, extremely low weight. And this is uh, 13 millimeter for B altitude. Again, incredibly low weight. This entire rocket without the motor weighs less than five grams. Five grams is what a nickel weighs. So they weigh truly nothing. But again, you have to really design them carefully to know how much nose weight you want to have in them, how much your altimeter is going to weigh uh, to get the, the uh, size of these correct. The final one here, uh, this is the current U.S. record holder for Micromax. Uh, this model flew to 84 meters, 275 feet on a Micromax engine. So again, paper rockets, something very different. Uh, you don't really read much about building light, but I hope that this has uh, brought you up to speed on some really fun stuff. All right, I am going to stop sharing and go to the Q&A. And hopefully this will work. Okay. Uh, all right, the first uh, question I see here uh, is from uh, Terrell. Uh, what program do I use for graphics? I use a Macintosh, and so I use a program called EasyDraw, E-A-Z-Y-D-R-A-W. Uh, okay, somebody said they can't see my mouse pointer. Uh, all right. Sorry, I didn't know that. Uh, how many popsicle sticks do I go through in the course of you? I tend to reuse them. I try to be uh, conservative. Uh Ed says he knows that paper has a grain like balsa. Uh, it, that's interesting, Ed. I, I know that for um, uh, the vellum that I use, it does not seem to, to favor one direction or another. I can do them vertically uh, or I can do them horizontally. I've never noticed any difference. Uh, I've never noticed a strength difference. I will tell you that for 13 millimeter tubes out of vellum, uh, no matter if you're using A motors, uh, if you're doing a two stage, I have never had one fail. Uh, that you just can't print these tubes. 18 millimeter, uh, I, I've never had one fail. I actually use these also uh, vellum tubes for uh, NAR streamer. Uh, never had one fail. Uh, I will say that longer tubes, uh, the uh, uh, 30 millimeter tubes uh, made out of vellum, uh, I have had those crimp. Uh, but then again, uh, those are using uh, uh, C motors uh, and uh, tend to be a bit stronger. Uh, Mark Bundick, when I install the motor mount tube using tight bond, doesn't it shrink the transition paper? The answer is no. The transition uh, on those is 30-pound uh, uh, cardstock, and you don't see anything. And again, it's so little, and where it's touching the transition, uh, Bunny, uh, it tends not to. I have also done it out of... Uh, uh, just wicking uh, CA in there, uh, that works well too. Let me see here. Uh, Sarah Jackson says uh, she's used to hearing uh, add nose weight for stability. Uh, is that an issue with paper rockets? Very much so. And uh, for, with those very lightweight nose cones, it's absolutely an issue. Uh, in fact, sometimes um, you could use non-vacuform uh, uh, nose cones uh, that would be uh, the appropriate weight and would be just as good. All right. I'm trying to see if there are more Q&A questions. I'm going to flip over to the chat. Uh, uh, let's see. 
Uh, I am not seeing any more in the chat. Uh, let's see. Oh, Ed Chess just asked a question. For minimum diameter vellum tubes, how do you get more than one use? My tubes always blister with the ejection charge. Ed, that's the point that I'm making. <laughs> I've actually had them catch on fire uh, from the uh, uh, ejection charge. Uh, I had to actually check the rules for NAR streamer duration. It does not prohibit you burning up your body tube. So I thought that that might be a, uh, a worthwhile uh, advantage. Uh, it turns out not to be because if they separate, you, you have a problem. But um, I, uh, like I showed, I use the short pieces of coupler tube uh, or I use that aluminum foil. The aluminum foil is just unbelievable. Uh, nothing will burn or blister. So uh, how, how do I back up my CA onions? <laughs> I don't... Uh, Andy, I don't get it, but Andy, thank you again so much. Uh, that simple article that you put online years ago has just led to a world of fun uh, for me and Emma. So, uh, Matt Ward, you mentioned fiberglass paper at one point. Uh, yeah, I I have used it, uh, made by my friend Jay Marsh, and uh, Jay also made it for Dr. Bob. Uh, it is very thin. The major benefit of that is that it weighs uh, a little bit less than vellum and it's waterproof. So Emma and I took it uh, with our uh, altitude models this time to Romania. Uh, we had tons of problems primarily with motors, but we also had a problem that I think that it was so lightweight that it tended to deform in the booster section. So I would have to uh, spend more time playing with it. Uh, I've never made it myself. Uh, uh let's see uh let's see foam rings do you cut them out of a foam sheet uh are they okay to use ca on good question mark uh i used to hand cut them and that's fine but i actually uh bought a box of depron foam now you can only buy it in like lifetime supply quantities it's not terribly expensive but i bought a huge box of this stuff and cut up about five sheets and sent it to Balsa Bill. Uh, in those days, Bill uh, would cut uh, centering rings, and uh, so he cut those for me. And I'm very grateful because they're way more precise. They're way easier to use. Uh, to glue them together, you have to use foam safe CA. Uh, if you use regular uh, super glue, uh, they will melt. Uh, the foam safe is also known as odorless CA, uh, and you don't need very much. Again, it's not really a stress point in the rocket, so even a little bit works. All right, Andy is uh, says use a hard tail tube and replace, uh, and uh, uh, and replace the fins. Yeah, I it's interesting. Uh, occasionally, I will have fins break off on these. Um, uh, for the uh, FAI style rockets, the fins actually go onto the motor mount tube as opposed to on the transition. But especially a sixty pound cardstock transition and uh, uh, a. Uh, uh, presentation paper transition, uh, the fins will hold on just fine. And it says CA gets brittle with heat, epoxy backup. Andy, I've never used it. Uh, the only thing uh, I I use epoxy for, and I, I get a lot of uh, pushback from my uh, international colleagues, uh, I use uh, epoxy to put fillets on these rockets. I know I don't need to. I know uh, that I could do them lighter weight. Emma and I have been doing this for years. We're so used to doing it. I use five-minute cheapo uh, epoxy, and they work just fine. So uh, I started doing that after the head of the NAR, a fellow named Trip Barber, took a look at our fillets and went, ugh. So that's why I started doing that. Uh, uh, Don Carson says, uh, Galactic Industries uh, makes custom centering rigs. I didn't know that Mike was doing that. Uh, that's great. Uh, so... All right, everybody, I think that pretty much uh, finishes my time. Uh, oh, maybe we have a couple more minutes if there's any more questions. Uh, guys, I hope that expanded your world a little bit. The one thing that you never, ever see online is how to build light. So, all right, it's time for me to stop the broadcast, so I will be doing that. Thank you, everyone.